All right. Well, thank you to Mount Sinai and Wellesley uh, for working quite hard to uh, bring me here. I know I'm something of a recluse, <laughs> so thank you for your patience. Um, and thank you to all the other speakers and panelists who have uh, contributed to this day. Uh, I've been honored to be here and learned a great deal. And um, my name is Jay Smooth. I come from the land of hip hop where people have funny names like that. And um, I've been blessed uh, through the public voice that hip hop gave me um, to have an opportunity to contribute to public discourse on issues I care about in a variety of venues, um, most prominently on uh, my website, Ill Doctrine, nowadays. Um, and Ill Doctrine is basically an, an ongoing series of video commentaries where I yell at people about being nicer to each other um, or about being kinder to each other, I think is a distinction that's important to make. And um, usually I'm uh, reacting to some bit of media stimuli, some bit of injustice um, that's in the mass media or some sort of failure to communicate or think effectively about injustice in the mass media. And uh, when I reach the point that I'm yelling at my TV screen or my monitor, um, that's when I know that it's time to turn the camera on and I sort of spend a few hours crushing that rage into a diamond and then I put that rage diamond on YouTube. And um, it's been the most uh, rewarding creative experience I've done and uh, has blessed me with a great opportunity to sort of strategize about how we can have more constructive public discourse uh, on the topics I care about, especially in the realm of uh, discrimination and bias, which is something that I've uh, always sort of had a passion and a fascination for, um, which I'll try to explain uh, later on. And I'm going to try to do that today. Um, talking about how bias and discrimination factor into uh, all the inequity that's been documented, you know, all the data that's been spoken of today, um, how it is embedded in all those things. And in the spirit of uh, trying to speak French uh, when in France, um, <laughs> I've taken the liberty of trying to reshape my talk somewhat uh, over the lunch break because I've gotten to see while I've been here that uh, I think all of you here are pretty far ahead of the game in terms of understanding the concepts and principles that I was planning to talk about. Um, you know, I think this work is very impressive. I can't think of anything uh, comparable to this that I've seen in the U.S. or in New York in terms of people in the healthcare field uh, being expl explicitly focused on these issues in such a clear, organized way. Um, so what I'm going to try to do instead of sort of not even preaching to the choir, but sort of preaching to the pastor, I feel like I would be doing, <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> just uh, share some of the experiences I've had over 25 years uh, within hip hop culture and uh, in more recent years in a broader uh, context of uh, communicating through mass media um, about these issues of bias and discrimination and sort of strategies and approaches I've experimented with um, for how to uh, seek more constructive conversation about bias and discrimination and their role in uh, driving all of these inequities. And um, I'm going to start real quick by showing one of my videos so you can be familiar with my work if I haven't seen it. This is my most recent video and I'm also showing it because it delves into the uh, lanes I want to try and explore today um, in terms of trying to think and speak more constructively about uh, discrimination and bias. And uh, this video specifically is about the LA Clippers owner, Donald Sterling, who you may have seen in the news, um, and his shenanigans. So uh, let's see if this works. This is uh, three things about the Donald Sterling tape. So the Donald Sterling tapes, yeah. The, the first thing I want to say about these tapes is these tapes should be the last nail in the coffin of the idea that there is any meritocracy in American capitalism. Any misconception that anyone ever had about rich people getting where they are because they're smarter than us had to die with this tape because, wow. There are so many levels of terribleness to these tapes, it's just like breathtaking. There's so much to study about the psychology of racism and sexism and just 
relationships. The very notion that what we hear on those tapes could be what some people think of as a relationship is horrifying to me. And then when I hear him laying into her with all this stuff like, why are you trying to hurt me? Don't you think I'm a good person? Why can't you be flexible about my racism? How do you know that you don't like racism if you haven't even tried it? When I hear Donald Sterling running all that low level game, it dawns on me how being in denial about racism and being a horrible manipulative boyfriend turn out to go really well with each other. They both basically work the same way. They're based on the same kind of mind games and evasive tactics and emotional abuse. They're a perfect match for each other. They go together like man and splaining. And there are so many other elements of this tape that I could go on about. The way that he's so invested in this inexplicable belief that she could be white or pass for white. The way he goes on about her being delicate, both as if being delicate is the measure of a woman's value and being delicate is the antithesis of being black. But the one part that stands out the most for me that I want to make sure to acknowledge is how this whole situation once again raises the question of why do racist words bring more accountability than racist practices? Because the thing about Donald Sterling is he's been known for years for being racist behind the scenes with his business practices. He already got taken to court years ago by the Department of Justice for trying to keep blacks and Latinos from living on his property. So the question for me is why did those decades of racist practices not bring the same kind of heat as these racist words? And I'm not saying Donald Sterling got too much attention for these words. He deserves all the heat he's getting right now. I'm glad those tapes came out. I hope more tapes come out. I hope he's like the Tupac of unreleased racism tapes and we can put them all together in a box set named Here's What They Think About You. But I just wish when I watch a story like this that we could figure out how to take that same energy and fury we bring to racist words and bring it just as hard to all the racist practices that generate injustice without generating TMZ clips. And that's not the snappiest ending, but I haven't made a video in a long time, so I'm just going to stop here. A pretty good example to try to work the, the sort of work I try to do, sort of packing some kind of substantive thought into this form that's small enough to have some virality and uh, try to vent my frustration about the pitfalls we tend to fall into when we discuss these issues and uh, the way we so easily get derailed into distraction. And um, as you can see, I'm most often drawn to looking at these things uh, through the lens of race. And I should say for this setting, race in the United States, because that's my lived experience and my passion. Um, but I do try to explore them in ways that are more broadly applicable um, as much as I can. Um, so when it comes to rooting out the causes of bias and discrimination and how we can counteract them. I think this Donald Sterling incident is important because it's a perfect example of how not to maintain a clear focus on these issues and uh, pursue solutions. It's a perfect illustration of how when it comes to race and racism and more broadly prejudice, bias, and discrimination, we tend to focus on personalities and theater more than behavior patterns and practices and policies. We focus more on intentions than impact um, and our, natu our natural tendency is to focus on simple bits of straightforward stimuli that we can grab and hold on to and that give us the impression of a smoking gun and a singular villain to fixate on. And uh, Donald Sterling was a particularly cartoonish villain. Um, but when you look at uh, the sort of data that uh, you've spoken about compiling all day, and uh, you know, you look at uh, health statistics, statistics that measure health disparities in the United States. Um, do I have that here also? Oh yes, how African Americans on average live about five years less than white Americans. Um, oh, okay, you can. I don't have that here, but you can see it there. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, uh, how many other non-white groups suffered a myriad a bunch of different health issues at higher rates than whites. Um, 
And I should say a lot of these disparities, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know all this, even when you account for other socioeconomic status differences, um, the disparities um, in race are still there. Um, and if you look at similar statistics in Canada, um, you can see different variations of the same theme. When you look at these sort of statistics and the real life harm to human beings um, that these numbers represent, um, I think we can agree that there is no cartoonishly evil soundbite or piece of viral media that we can hold accountable for them. There's no single smoking gun or singular tabloid TV villain that we can focus our rage upon for the span of one news cycle in order to understand and address those persistent inequities. And um, I would assert that although there's certainly no shortage of overt bigots in the world um, and any brief perusal of YouTube comments on any, any of my videos or any videos <laughs> will make that clear. Um, I would nonetheless assert that uh, for every one of us who gets caught on tape um, trying to keep Negroes off of Instagram, there are a hundred others of us who would never be caught saying such things and hold no such feelings constantly, uh, consciously in our heart, but who still in our everyday actions and behaviors uh, wind up acting in ways that perpetuate an unjust status quo and manifest um, bias and perpetuate inequity. And by the same token, on a systemic structural level, for every one group that holds secret meetings about how to keep us down, there are 100 other institutions that don't intend to be part of the problem, um, but nonetheless fail to be a part of the solution. And uh, you know, like I said, I think we seem to be pretty mindful of that here already and ahead of the game. Um, but hopefully I can give more ammunition for how to bring uh, the rest of the world on board and continue to be mindful of uh, continue to be mindful ourselves because that's something we each have to practice and maintain, uh, which I'll speak more about later. Um, so the question is, the question that I grapple with in a lot of my work is in a world in which most of us mean well, but we still don't do well uh, to bring about the change we need, um, how do we shift that conversation. A couple of my videos were featured recently on Upworthy.com and in a typically provocative Upworthy headline it said, I'm not racist, you're not racist, so what is there to talk about? Um, and the answer I've been drawn to most often in various forms in my media work um, is that those of us who do mean well and work for institutions that ostensibly mean well need to talk about the impact of uh, implicit bias. Um, I'm impressed when I have the correct slide come up. Um, how, how our natural tendency as humans to develop unconscious biases works to shape and contort the behavior of individuals who mean well and institutions that ostensibly mean well. And how the belief that we mean well and that meaning well is enough can blind us to the impact of those unconscious biases beneath it. Um, and as I'm sure you know, um, through most of the first half of the 20th century, um, most research into racism was treating it as something pathological, that it was a deviation from normal healthy human behavior. Um, but in more recent decades, there's been a focus on how our normal, natural human instincts and cognitive processes push us all towards developing those blind spots and prejudices. And um, as a general concept, in a broader sense, this is something I was exposed to vividly uh, growing up, the more general notion that unconscious cognitive processes can shape our interactions with each other and cause each other to unwittingly be clumsy or do harm. I got a lot of exposure to that growing up because as a growing boy of mixed heritage uh, with a black dad and a white mom who self-identified as black but who is visually, racially indistinct, um, I would often have the experience growing up where uh, when I met people for the first time, um, because people weren't sure how to categorize me, there would be a sort of an awkward pause. There'd be a hitch in the conversation. It was usually a subtle thing. Um, but what would happen is when we meet each other for the first time, generally, we go through an instinctive process of in-group, out-group categorization. There's a bunch of different cues and stimuli we use to decide are you an us 
or are you a they? But what would happen with me is uh, not all the time, but often enough that a young kid with a lot of social anxiety would be acutely aware of it. Um, people would meet me and uh, begin that instinctive in-group, out-group categorization on me, but their conscious mind would throw a wrench in it because they weren't sure if that instinctive categorization was correct. They would say, whoa, whoa, wait, is he? I don't, what, what are you? Um, so it would uh, take that usually unconscious process and throw a wrench in it and bring it into the conscious mind. And um, back at that time, I strongly resented this. Um, it contributed to my sense of not being able to connect and my sort of social isolation. Now that I'm older and my sense of self is a bit more sturdy, I've grown to appreciate uh, the insight you get from those awkward moments from taking that usually unconscious process and uh, tripping it up so it comes up into the conscious level. Um, I've grown to appreciate the insight you get into how illogical and arbitrary and absurd our concepts of race are in practice and for how they kept reminding me growing up that most of us mean well and want to make positive connections with each other, but our universally imperfect human instincts um, often lead us to be clumsy or awkward or hurtful uh, despite ourselves. And that's a relatively minor tangential example, um, but there's been lots of study of the ways that specifically um, implicit bias manifests and shapes our interactions and, uh, and can impact how our institutions serve the public uh, without us being aware of uh, that impact. Um, two social scientists whose work I've read a lot and learned a lot from are Samuel Gertner and John DeVidio, um, who have studied this concept under uh, the term aversive racism. Um, and what they found is that the phenomenon that they tracked was a dual layered phenomenon where people who are consciously liberal and strive to be egalitarian um, unconsciously manifest prejudice towards other groups. They find that other group aversive and they find the possibility that they might be prejudice aversive and being questioned on that or uh, thinking about it, they have an aversion to that as well. Um, so basically what Gartner and DeVideo's research found is that uh, the plight of most good, well-meaning human beings is that we want not to be prejudiced, but we don't know how not to be prejudiced. Um, and what makes it worse, if I can channel Donald Rumsfeld, is we don't know that we don't know how not to be prejudiced. Um, and they found uh, in their research on aversive racism that uh, this kind of unconscious bias is most likely to manifest, and this is an insight that's deep to me into how tricky and treacherous these processes are. It manifests most um, distinctly when there are other plausible explanations for the, for the discriminatory choice. Like in one of the earliest studies Gartner in the video did, they found that um, if a white person witnesses an accident or an emergency situation and they believe they're the only one who witnessed it, um, there wasn't much of a statistical disparity in whether they would help the black or the white victim. But if their understanding was that other people had witnessed the accident, there was then a stark disparity on whether they would help a black person um, compared to whether they would help uh, a white victim. So when there's a clear-cut set of criteria that make it impossible for you to rationalize this as other than prejudiced, um, people are more likely to make the egalitarian choice. But if there's enough ambiguity and enough other criteria um, that allow you to rationalize this choice as being due to some other factors, uh, people are naturally more likely to make the discriminatory choice, um, probably without being aware that they've just played that mind trick on themselves. Um, and if you look at a lot of other studies since then, um, I'm sure you've seen the recent study of uh, how in states that don't have drug testing laws, 
Um, the data says that black applicants are more likely to be turned away based on the assumption that they might use drugs, not that I'm necessarily endorsing drug testing laws. Um, Dr. Philip Ativa Goff at UCLA has done great work on how male police officers are more likely to use their firearms on black men due to this instinctive perception of increased masculinity threat from a black male. Um, and Dr. Knox Todd, and I learned about this through uh, David Williams um, at Harvard, um, who has a lot of talks online where he drops a lot of knowledge. Um, but uh, Dr. Knox Todd at Emory University has done a few studies where he found that blacks and Latinos, and this is an example in the field of healthcare, um, are less likely to be given pain medication than white patients with the same condition. So in each of those cases, you have public servants who need to quickly assess a bunch of different factors before choosing how to act. And um, you see a pattern of discrimination occurring in these situations where it could easily be consciously rationalized as based on other criteria. Um, so how do we break that cycle? How do we get people to be conscious of that? Um, how do we move our public discourse on, these, on discrimination and inequities towards addressing unjust practices that may not be carried out by explicitly racist actors um, is something I've put a lot of thought into in my media work, and I want to share a couple of examples of how I've tried to find effective messaging and tried to learn as I uh, went along. Um, I made a video about six years ago now um, named How to Tell Someone They Sound Racist. Um, that tries to address that question and uh, move us towards looking at the impact rather than the intent, intent and the conscious thought process. Um, and over the years, it's become by far my most popular video. It's been viewed over a million times. It's used in uh, the curriculum, in different college courses, and uh, which I think shows that there's a great deal of thirst for more effective tools uh, to grapple with these issues. So I'm, I'm going to show that video real quick and then talk about what I've learned from the, the ongoing response to that video and the sort of crucial missing pieces from the analysis in the video um, that I've been trying to grapple with since then. So this is uh, how to tell someone to sound racist. Race, the final frontier. No matter what channel you watch, no matter what feed you aggregate, it seems like everybody everywhere is talking about race right now. And when everybody everywhere is talking about race, that means sooner or later you're going to have to tell somebody that they said something that sounded racist. So you need to be ready and have a plan in place for how to approach the inevitable that sounded racist conversation. And I'm going to tell you how to do that. The most important thing that you've got to do is remember the difference between the what they did conversation and the what they are conversation. Those are two totally different conversations and you need to make sure that you pick the right one. The what they did conversation focuses strictly on the person's words and actions and explaining why what they did and what they said was unacceptable. This is also known as the that thing you said was racist conversation and that's the conversation that you want to have. The what they are conversation on the other hand takes things one step further and uses what they did and what they said to draw conclusions about what kind of person they are. This is also known as the I think you are a racist conversation. This is the conversation you don't want to have because that conversation takes us away from the facts of what they did and the speculation about their motives and intentions and those are things you can only guess at, you can't ever prove and that makes it way too easy for them to derail your whole argument. And that is the part that's crucial to understand. When you say, I think he's a racist, that's not a bad move because you might be wrong. That's a bad move because you might be right. Because if that dude really is racist, you want to make sure you hold him accountable and don't let him off easy. And even though in Intuitively, it feels like the hardest way to hit him is just run up on him and say, I think your ass is racist. When you handle it that way, you're actually letting him off easy because you're setting up a conversation that's way too simple for him to derail and duck out of. Just think about how this plays out every time a politician or a celebrity gets caught out there. It always starts out as a what they did conversation. But as soon as the celebrity and their defenders get on camera, they start doing judo flips and switching it into a what they are conversation. I have known this person for years and I know for a fact that they are not a racist and how dare you claim to know what's inside their soul just because they made one little joke about watermelon tap dancing and going back to Africa. And then you try and explain that we don't need to see inside their soul to know that they shouldn't have said all that about the watermelon. And you try to focus on the facts of the situation, but by then it's too late because the what they are conversation 
person is a rhetorical Bermuda Triangle where everything drowns in a sea of empty posturing until somebody just blames it all on hip hop and we forget the whole thing ever happened. Don't let this happen to you. When somebody picks my pocket, I'm not gonna be chasing him down so I can figure out whether he feels like he's a thief deep down in his heart. I'm gonna be chasing him down so I can get my wallet back. I don't care what he is, but I need to hold him accountable for what he did. And that's how we need to approach these conversations about race. Treat them like they took your wallet and focus on the part that matters. Holding each person accountable for the impact of their words and actions. I don't care what you are. I care about what you did. So that was a video I made in 2008. Um, in response to sort of a different set of issues, it was more how conversations about race play out in the mass media, specifically during the 2008 election. Um, I think I made this video right after Bill Clinton made those strange remarks comparing Obama to Jesse Jackson. Um, but over the years since it came out, it's come to be used and applied in a bunch of different contexts. Um, people have found a bunch of uses for it, but the one Achilles heel is that uh, whoever's the person you're trying to address that critique to, it increases the odds of persuading them from one in 10,000 to about one in 9,998, maybe. Um, I mean, I think it's still valuable to uh, try to achieve that clarity. Um, first of all, because whenever we engage in this sort of dialogue nowadays, we're often doing it online, which means that we're creating a persistent public document with each conversation, so we need to remember that uh, we are recording a dialogue that's gonna be witnessed by far more people than whoever is the target of your critique, and uh, a much more useful contribution in the long run is probably how you're contributing to the environment of ideas that we all share and that the next generation is gonna come up into. Um, so I think that default mindset of assuming that persuading your antagonist is the only measure of an effective argument, I don't think was ever truly the case, but I think it's especially outdated now that almost every conversation we have creates this persistent public document. Um, but nonetheless, um, we still need some sort of angle to try and persuade people who are stuck in these traps to uh, reconsider and introspect and try to break out of it. And what I've seen from the feedback I've gotten over the video and the dialogue is generated that I, in, in this video I was addressing how to deliver this sort of critique, but the fundamental change that needs to happen is how all of us receive this sort of critique. Um, because it's an instinct that we all share and without uh, suggesting any sort of false equivalencies where we're all equally privileged in the grand scheme of things, because that's certainly not the case. Um, there are gonna be particular instances where each of us is on the more privileged end of an equation and uh, our prejudices and blind spots and behavior are gonna be challenged. Um, so we all need to develop an ability to take that criticism and uh, receive it with humility and, ac and actually Consider it. You, you, you don't have to, as a default, take it as gospel. You, know, you, you can challenge and debate, but you need to, at the very least, consider it with humility and consider the possibility that the target of this sort of bias that you'll never experience is perceiving something from you that you might not be able to see within yourself. Um, but because of that layer of aversion um, that Gartner and video talk about, and because of our tendency to think of racism and prejudice as an all or nothing binary in which you're either a good person who is not prejudiced or you're a bad person who is prejudiced, um, it's extremely difficult to break out of that sort of mind trap and be able to even consider um, that there might be imperfections underneath the surface that we need to work on. Um, so in the aftermath of that video, um, I've been trying to explore approaches to pull in the public and encouraging myself um, to engage with the concept of implicit bias as a way to sort of set us free from the stress of thinking that any imperfection in our non-racist in our non-racist track record makes us a bad person. Um, that 
acquainting ourselves with the concept of implicit bias frees us from the stress of believing that we need to be perfect in order to be good. Um, and in, in my follow-up video, uh, which has a long name I can never recall, what is it, how I learned to stop worrying and, uh, love star and start to love discussing race, um, I talk about uh, what Moya referred to, the sort of dental hygiene paradigm of uh, race discourse, which more broadly applies uh, to prejudice and bias in general. Um, and the basic notion is that uh, we tend to think of being racist or being prejudiced as akin to having your tonsils, a sort of an all or nothing zero sum game um, in which you either have prejudice or you don't. And if you do not currently have prejudice, that's a fixed immutable state um, comparable to having your tonsils taken out. But the reality of how these things work is because we all share um, these same natural unconscious processes and we're all constantly absorbing uh, media and societal stimuli that encourage us to harbor uh, stereotypes. All of us who are consciously good, uh, well-meaning people have a natural tendency to develop blind spots and prejudice the same way that plaque develops on your teeth. Um, so the more sensible way to think of uh, being prejudiced or not and being a good person or not is that uh, someone telling you that uh, you have exhibited some sort of blind spot or prejudice is the same as telling you uh, that you have something stuck in your teeth. That it's not an accusation that you're a bad person, but uh, a confirmation that I believe you are a good person and uh, therefore would want to know about this. Just like telling me there's something stuck in my teeth says to me that you think I want to have good hygiene. Um, it doesn't tell me that you think I'm a dirty bum or something like that. Um, and you know, to expand that to the work that, that all of you do, I guess you could say um, maintaining a mindfulness of our tendency towards implicit bias and an understanding of it as a natural human thing um, allows us to relate to being good not as this sort of fixed immutable state, but as a practice that we maintain every day, just like being healthy is a practice that you maintain every day. And if we're able to wrap our head around that, it's counterintuitive. Um, and it's a, it's a variation of the reasoning that Eduardo Bonilla Silva gives about uh, privilege, that people think of privilege as something that is imposing a sense of guilt upon you for having it. But if you properly understand privilege as the result of systems that have been around before you were born, um, then that should liberate you from a sense of individual blame for having privilege and connect you with a sense of collective, and co uh, collective responsibility for what we're going to do about that privilege. And likewise, what I have uh, tried to find ways uh, to advocate for is that if we can recognize that our natural tendency uh, to develop these blind spots and prejudices uh, that divide us from each other, um, how can I explain this? Um, if we can recognize that our natural tendency to develop these uh, implicit biases that divide us from each other are one of the core human traits that uh, actually unites us all in our common humanity, um, then we can see an ongoing relationship and uh, a comfort and embrace of our human imperfection, like a, a willingness to uh, be mindful of and accept our human imperfections as a part of what makes us all connected human beings, um, then we can be set free from that burden of thinking we have to be perfect and any criticism makes us a bad racist person. And uh, we can move towards taking that collective responsibility um, towards figuring out how to be mindful of and uh, minimize and mitigate the impact of the implicit bias uh, that we all tend to share and the ways that it manifests for us both individually and, and, and uh, on an institutional level. I'm usually thinking more in terms of individual and interpersonal, but my colleagues at Race Forward have applied sort of similar concepts um, in their work with institutions and what they found is that if you set up structures and practices for yourself um, where you are uh, 
priming, they call it equity primes, um, if you have a system in place that gives you stimuli, specifically at the choice points where you might act on implicit bias and perpetuate discrimination, um, over time, you're gonna develop the habit of looking for that implicit bias to pop up and uh, nipping it in the bud before it determines your action. Um, and I, I think of it as, uh, the pet name I have for it is phone keys wallet, because through most of my life, whenever I've left the house, I have walked out the door either without my phone or my keys or my wallet. So I've developed a conscious habit of when I'm coming in the front door, saying out loud, phone, keys, wallet, phone, keys, wallet. And what race forward, um, I hope they don't mind me uh, adjusting it this way. Um, what they try to implement is a sort of a phone, keys, wallet within, within an institution whenever you're at that doorway, if I can stretch the metaphor, uh, where you're going to make a choice, um, decide some sort of policy, make some sort of hiring decision. Um, if you have a set of equity primes, if you have even just a checklist of questions that remind you of where the inequities are within your field or your work and uh, encourages you to be mindful and conscious of how your decisions will affect that, um, then it shifts how you as an individual or your organization um, is making those decisions. And, and an example, let me see, can I, do I have a slide for that? Yeah, uh, okay, yes. Um, yeah, an example that they cite in their work is uh, that uh, the National Council of Juvenile Justice and Family Court Judges instituted uh, this program where they had juvenile court judges look at bench cards, a visual aid that uh, gives them questions to ask when they're making determinations about where to place children in foster care. And the bench card asks things like, uh, who should be present when determining uh, these things at determination hearings? Um, have you engaged the parents? Have you made efforts to prevent removal? Um, have you considered uh, the Child Welfare Act? And when they implemented this project, they found that 45% more children were able to return home to their parents or live with extended family members when they had that bench card um, after first hearing that children are removed from their home. Um, so that, uh, I've, gone to, I, I've gone into the uh, stuff I added at the last minute, so I'm not sure how to close. But those are, <laughs> um, those are some of the ideas that I've tried to implement in my work both in hip hop and in other social justice areas, um, which I think, like I said, you all already seem to be far down the road on. Um, how we're, but uh, I think if we can encourage people um, to recognize that the presence of implicit bias is something that we all as good people have and shift that understanding of human goodness as a commitment to being mindful of those imperfections and maintaining goodness um, just as we maintain our health, um, then in very small, slow, protracted ways, we might be able to make a little bit of movement um, towards shifting ourselves and our institutions from meaning well to actually helping all of us be well and shifting all of that data that you all collect just a little bit. Um, so that's my rant about being nice for today. It was, it was a pleasure and an honor to be here with you.